Uh, if you have not met me, my name is Luke Hermson. I am an intern here at City Park Church, and it's really just such a blessing, and I'm so excited to be here today. I've actually been on this stage every day this week, not to preach, but as to act in the kids' camp skit that we did last week. Um, I got to play the role of Jungle Cruise skipper C.J. McGee, and one of the days I actually got to wrestle an alligator up there where we just watched a baptism. So this is a bit of a transition. I'm hoping I don't accidentally say some of my lines from the skit instead of my sermon notes. Um, but seriously, Kids Camp was really awesome. Thank you to everyone who showed up to help and serve, everyone who prayed, and everyone who sent their little kiddos. It was just a really special time. Anyways, uh, if you've been here the last few weeks, you'll know that we recently started a new series called Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? That is because what no one can deny is that 2,000 years ago, there lived a man named Jesus of Nazareth, and he changed the entire world. And the most important question that every human being can ask is who is he? Who is Jesus? So we've been spending weeks, we're gonna be spending more weeks talking about answering that question through the authority of the word of God. And as we talked about, there's several different ways that we can answer this question. First week, we talked about how Jesus is the son of God. Then we talked about how Jesus is the word of God. And last week, Noah preached through, chapter, through Luke chapter four, talking about how Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah and King from the Old Testament. And this week, we're gonna be staying on that topic we're gonna be going a little bit different of a direction and talking about how Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. What do I mean by that? I mean that Jesus, faith alone in Jesus, is sufficient for our salvation. That Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is enough for us to be reconciled before God. And many of you know there's a lot of false teaching in our culture a lot of different versions of Christianity, which whether they say it or not, will deny the truth, deny this truth that Jesus is enough. They add to the requirements of, to, they add to the requirements of salvation. They'll say faith alone plus this, plus this, plus works, some type of hybrid of our faith and our works as necessary for salvation. And also often, even if we understand the truth that Jesus is enough, we often act like it's not true. It's so important for us to understand, yet it's so easy to, for us to forget. So today we're going to be walking through a passage in Galatians 3, where Paul talks about this, and Paul really, he's writing to a church that has fallen under this false teaching. And we're going to be learning about how Jesus is enough through the words of Paul. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are here, you are working Lord, thank you for being in our midst. Thank you that we have the opportunity to join with several others from around the world and all of the heavenly hosts to worship and exalt your name. And I pray during this time that your name would be exalted and praised. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me this morning, that it wouldn't be my words and that I would preach the truth, Lord, and that you would open our hearts and ears as only you can to receive the truth, Lord. We're desperate for the movement of your spirit, God. We love you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, as I was thinking about how to introduce this sermon, I um, thought about starting with an illustration or asking a question or a story or something like that. But the more I thought about it, the more I found it fitting to talk a little bit about one of the biggest struggles I've had in my life, and a little bit about my story, as it strongly relates to the passage and what this topic that we're gonna be talking about today in Galatians. So a little of my story, the Lord opened my eyes to the gospel at a young age. I was about nine years old. At age 11, I really started to press into my faith. I started to study through scripture and fall in love with God. But as I continued in my young walk, I remember feeling this constant need that I needed to prove myself to God. I believed in what he did for me on that cross. 
I believed that my sins were forgiven, but for some reason I just felt this burden that if I didn't live a certain way or do certain things, that the Lord would look at me differently. And it became so overwhelming that I would start to do weird things, like I would have to pray for five minutes before I ate absolutely anything. If there was any trash I saw outside anywhere, I would have to pick it up. I would do weird things like feel like I need to fall on my knees and worship in random public places. Now, all these things might not sound bad. They might sound a little weird, but certainly not harmful. But the problem was, my motivation for doing these things was that I was worried that God would look at me differently if I didn't. Part of me was believing that I could only be right before God by doing certain good deeds and proving my loyalty to him. And in doing so, I was starting to rely on my works for my standing before God and not on Christ's finished work. And I think we all tend to do this at times. We all tend to live this way at times. And it didn't fully hit me about five years into my faith journey when I realized I was not walking in the freedom that Jesus had called me to. And I was reminded of the truth of the gospel. That in Christ, my standing before God has nothing to do with my works because Jesus is enough. That there's nothing I could do to make God love me less and there's nothing I could do to make God love me more. And when that finally set in, it was such a freeing and relieving feeling. And I think many of you, in, in some ways, relate to my story in, at sometimes living like Jesus is not enough. You live with this burden to prove yourself to God. You live with the mindset that God is judging you based on your works as a believer in Christ. Maybe some of you are starting down the path of depending on your works and moving away from the cross altogether. Or maybe you've never actually put your faith in the work of Christ and are living with this misconception that you can earn your way to heaven. And in doing so, believing that Jesus is not enough. Wherever you are this morning, I pray that Paul's words in today's passage are a wake-up call for all of us. So today we're going to be picking up in the middle, in the meat of Paul's letter to the Galatians. Who are very far down this path of reliance on their works and not on their faith in Christ. In our passage today, Paul is leading the Galatians to remember how their partnership with God has always been through faith in the work of Christ and has never been dependent on their following of the law. Further, anyone who is not fully dependent on the work of Christ is in serious danger because a reliance on our works for salvation, even in part, is a full abandonment of the gospel. Here are the two key takeaways I hope you walk away with today. First, if you are relying on what you do for your justification before the Lord, then your faith is not in Christ and you stand under condemnation. Second, if your faith is in Christ, then I pray that this morning is a reminder for you that there is nothing more you need to do for your salvation. Our main point this morning is this. Jesus is enough. Faith in him is sufficient for salvation. And living like there is still more to do to earn his blessing is abandoning the gospel. Jesus is enough. Faith in him is sufficient for salvation. And living like there is still more to do to earn his blessing is abandoning the gospel. Now before we get into this passage, I'd like to take some time to put in its context and give more details about the background of this letter. So the Galatian churches have been infiltrated. False teachers have come into this church and are preaching a distorted gospel that several are believing in. These false teachers, they're known as the Judaizers. They're confusing people to believe that they must still submit to the Old Testament law of Moses in order to be saved. So on one of Paul's mission trips, he went to Galatia. They received the gospel with joy, this gospel of faith alone. But now this new group is coming. And they're saying that the next step of their salvation is that they must be circumcised, which is the sign of the law, and fully submit to the law of Moses. So basically, they're making this kind of hybrid gospel of, yes, faith alone, but you still need to submit to the Old Testament law of Moses. It's still about your works. The people of these churches had a distorted gospel that taught the necessity of both faith and works to be justified before God, and that is what Paul is addressing in this letter. Read with me in Galatians 3, verse 1 through 9. Galatians 3, verses 1 through 9. Paul says, 
O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This first section I have labeled a call to remember. And as you can tell from the first words of today's passage, O foolish Galatians, Paul's tone here is harsh. The letter to the Galatians, it's not like one of those cute letters you get in the mail from the dentist that say, just a friendly reminder, it's time for your dentist cleanup. No, that's not what this is. This is like that last eviction notice that's slid under your door that's saying you have to do this or you're getting kicked out. This is serious. This is a warning. And it's important that we understand Paul's tone here because this church is on the verge of apostasy, on the verge of abandoning the gospel altogether. And so far in this letter, Paul has been talking about this idea of justification by faith alone in more theological and abstract terms. And what he's doing at this point of his argument in Galatians 3 is he's taking it to their life. He's taking it to their experiences by causing them to remember certain experiences and then asking them a series of rhetorical questions as Paul loves to do. He's about to put together a beautifully stringed argument that will eventually lead to the conclusion that Jesus is enough. So I'd ask you to just try to follow along with Paul's argument as we walk through this passage. Verse 1 says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that it was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified? That first point in your notes is remember the cross. And I love how Paul starts here with the cross of Christ, and it's where we ought to start this morning as well. He said, it was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, these churches were likely not actually present at the crucifixion, but what Paul probably means is that it was presented to them in such a vivid way, it was like they were experiencing it live. So these people were living with this mindset that their salvation was in some way dependent on their works, and Paul is saying, no, like you know that Jesus suffered. You know what Jesus went through. You know that he took all your sins on the cross. What more is needed? And as he points out a few verses earlier in verse 2, 21, he says, if righteousness could be gained through the law, if righteousness could be gained through our works, then Christ died for nothing. If what Jesus did was not enough, then it was all in vain. If our works could justify us before God, then all the suffering that Jesus went through is pointless. So by bringing them back to the cross, he is helping them remember what Jesus went through and reminding them that it was not for nothing. And we're going to be talking more about Christ's death later on in this message. But it's important to note here that Paul starts his argument by stating that it is about what Jesus did, not about what we do. Continue with me in verses 2 and 3. Let me ask you only this. Also, I love how he says, let me ask you only this, and then begins to ask like seven questions. He says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? I think something that's hard in like letters and texts and emails and all that sometimes, it's hard to get like the tone across and it's hard to tell what people's tone are. It's not hard to tell what Paul's tone is here. Are you so foolish? He continues to say. So Paul continues this. He asks them how they received the Holy Spirit. And why does he ask him this? Because a person receiving the Holy Spirit is the seal of their salvation. It's the sign of their salvation. As soon as you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. So again, Paul's bringing them back to their experiences. So he's bringing them back to the experience of when they were saved and received the Spirit. And then asking them if this was by the Spirit or by their works. So I'll ask you to do the same this morning. If you're here and you are 
your faith is in Christ, if you have received salvation, received the Holy Spirit, just take a moment to just go back to when that happened. Think about the moment that Jesus saved you from death to life. Maybe if there's not one specific moment that you can think of in your mind, just think of a period of life or think of a time where you've noticed the Spirit so present in your life and then ask yourself, ask yourself, as Paul did to the Galatians, did this happen by your works finally being good enough to receive the salvation or did it happen through faith? And I hope all your answers are through faith and faith that Jesus is enough. That is how we receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says in verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So Paul's being kind of smart and sarcastic with them here, and rightfully so. He's saying if you received the Spirit by faith, what makes you think that there's now this second movement, that there's this second requirement of your Christianity, that now you have to also submit to the law to be saved? God did the work of saving you, and he will do the work of keeping you. As Paul says in Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, Paul then says, Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? The next point is to remember the suffering. Remember the suffering. In verse 4, Paul reminds them, of the experience of the persecution they faced for the gospel. This church suffered greatly because of this gospel that they preached originally through faith alone in Christ. And so if they're now abandoning that gospel, what was the point of all that suffering? Paul pointed out in the beginning of this letter that the reason for this distorted gospel, the reason the Judaizers were teaching this gospel was to please man. Because these Jews, their whole lives revolved around following the law to a T in order to be righteous enough. They believed that our salvation was dependent on how well we followed the law, and they believed that they were following the law pretty well. But this gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, teaches that they will never be righteous enough, that our salvation actually has nothing to do with how well we follow the law. So this was extremely offensive. And because of this gospel, they were persecuted. And now Paul's like, you suffered all these things because you preached the message of faith alone. And now, by this new works-based gospel that you're starting to believe in, you're basically just agreeing with the people that beat you. What was the point of all that suffering if you're just going to abandon the gospel? Did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? He's having them look back, remember everything they've been through for the gospel, and pleading with them to not abandon it. Verse 5, Paul says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So Paul furthers his argument by reminding them of the miracles they've seen God do in their life. They've been witnesses to the Spirit working miracles in amazing ways and God moving all around them. So again, just take a moment to reflect. Take a moment to reflect on your life. Take a moment to reflect on all the amazing things you've seen God do in your life. The moments where you've just sat back speechless after seeing God so clearly move. And if you've been walking with Jesus for a while, I know you know what I mean. Those moments where you've just seen God show up in amazing ways. Or think about times when you've seen God work through you. And then ask yourself, did those things happen? Did those things happen because of you or because of God? Did those things happen because of your amazing works or because you had faith in an amazing God? Did they happen because you are enough or because Jesus is? Now these questions again are rhetorical, but the answer is implied that it was through faith. The Lord is and always has been doing the work. He saved us on the cross. He gave us his spirit. He works to conform us to the image of Jesus. He works miracles in our lives. It is all him, and when we reflect on that, It seems so silly to consider that our works have anything to do with our standing before God. Jonathan Edwards, a great preacher in the 1700s, once famously said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except for the sin that made it necessary. You contribute nothing to your salvation except for the sin that made it necessary. Brothers and sisters, if you have been saved from hell, delivered from sins that you never thought you could be delivered from, 
If you've seen amazing things done in your life and amazing things done through you, do not be confused that it was the Spirit responsible for it all. So if begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Of course not. Let us not fall under the thinking that there is more for us to do to improve our standing before the Lord. Your status before God as a Christian is fixed in God's work. So let's not make the fatal mistake of putting that burden on ourselves. And yes, we are to live righteously. Do not understand me. This isn't an excuse to just live however you want. We are to live righteously and strive for righteousness, but not to achieve salvation flowing out of the salvation that we have through faith. We are not to strive for righteousness because Jesus is not enough, but because he is enough. Continue with me in verse 6. Paul brings us back. He says, Just as Abraham believed in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So he's talking about the experiences in their life, and now he's bringing them back. He's bringing them back to Abraham. He's bringing them back to remember that it's actually always been about faith. And Paul knows exactly what he's doing by bringing Abraham into this. Because Abraham was the father of their faith. Abraham was the highest regarded figure of, for the Israelites, for, their, for Christianity. And this verse here, it says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. This is quoted from Genesis 15.6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And interestingly, Abraham was circumcised in Genesis 17. So what Paul's showing here is that before he was circumcised, he was counted righteous before God. So Paul is just cooking in his argument right now. The Judaizers claimed that to be saved and to be a son of Abraham, you had to be circumcised and submit to the law. But if Abraham was saved before he was even circumcised, how can this claim make any sense? It doesn't. And that's why he says in verse 7, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. He is showing them that faith in Jesus has always been enough, even before Jesus came. Now a lot of people have a huge misunderstanding of the law, so I want to take a little bit of time and talk about that. Because I know I had a big mis misunderstanding of the law for a while, or just of how things worked before Christ came. Many think that in the days before Jesus, people were saved by how well they followed the law. If they were circumcised, if they ate the right kinds of food, if they made the right amount of sacrifices to atone for their sin. But when we couldn't do it, God decided to send Jesus, and now it is no longer about work, now it's about faith. This is incorrect, and there's a lot of problems with this thinking. First, it implies an inconsistent God between the Old and New Testament. To think that it used to be works leading to salvation, and now it's faith leading to salvation and works following, that would mean that God changed the plan. It would mean that salvation through works was the original plan, and when that didn't work, Jesus was like the plan B, the backup plan. God was hoping we would follow the law well enough to be saved, but when we didn't, he went to plan B. That is not True, and that is a terrible misunderstanding because the pattern of salvation has always been faith, salvation, works. That has always been the pattern. God always makes the first move, and our works flow out of that through his power. Last year, we spent a lot of time in Exodus, and we even saw this pattern in Exodus. God saved Israel from slavery, and then he gave them the law. Salvation, and then works. And Paul will make it clear later in this book that the law was never intended to bring salvation. The reason the law was added was to show us how sinful we are. Salvation was always through faith. Abraham was saved through his faith. And as it says in verse 8, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all nations be blessed. This is from Genesis 12. We don't often think of the gospel being preached in Genesis 12, but Paul says that it was. 
Paul says that God preached the gospel even before the law when he promised that salvation would extend past Israel, would extend past the circumcision party to all nations through faith. Jesus Christ was the plan from eternity's past. He was not the plan B when God's original plan didn't work out. And we have to understand that when we come into any conversation about the law. And this is what I believe Paul is pointing out here. He's pointing out to the churches in this section. First, he points to their own experiences to show how redemption in their life has always been through faith. And now he's pointing them to redemptive history. He's having them remember redemptive history. And the fact that even before Christ came, even before Israel was a nation, it was still always about faith and not works. Paul is just impressing on these people's minds that this notion of salvation through works in addition to the law, or works of the law in addition to faith, is just absolute lunacy. And as he says in verse 9, So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. He's saying if they want to be sons of Abraham, if they want to have this blessing of eternal life, if they want to be included in God's chosen people, then they must know that it is done through faith. It is through faith alone. It was through faith alone, and it will always be through faith alone. And my hope this morning is that Paul's words resonate with us as well. Because a proper understanding of faith and works is essential for our doctrine. It is the basis of our faith because to add works to faith as a requirement for salvation is to say that Jesus Christ is not enough. And as Paul will point out in this next section, if we rely on our works at all, we are in grave danger. Continue with me. Galatians 3, verses 10 through 14. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Paul is making it very clear here that we can either rely fully on our work or on the work of Christ. There is not this middle hybrid of combining the two. You either go the route of depending on your works to be saved, or you go the route of faith alone in Christ. At the beginning of the summer, I got to spend some time at an internship in New England, and I had a roommate, and his name was Yubo, and he was from Singapore. Yubo, if you're watching this, shout out. Um, one morning as we were eating breakfast, I was talking to Yubo. I was just curious what it would take if, for him to become an American citizen if he wanted to do that. And as he was explaining to me the process, one thing I found really interesting is that according to Singapore, Singapore rules, if he wanted to be a citizen of America, he would have to completely renounce his citizenship to Singapore. Singapore does not allow for dual citizenship. So if he, didn't want to be, if he wanted to be a citizen of America, he could no longer be affiliated, he could no longer be considered a citizen of Singapore by any means. He was fully an American citizen. And I say that because it's the same, it's the same way with us. If you want to be under the blood of Christ, if you want to be saved through faith and faith alone, then you have to leave this idea of justification through our works and earning behind. If you want to go the route of relying on Jesus, then you have to leave reliance on yourself behind. Because depending at all on your works to save you is denying that Jesus is enough and declaring that there's still more to do. And that's what these Judaizers were teaching. They were teaching this hybrid between the two that doesn't exist. Verse 10 through 12, Paul says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is, just, now it is evident that no one is justified by God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. So Paul is continuing this genius argument by going back and quoting through the law itself. He's going back to the law itself, bringing quotes from the law to further his argument. 
And by this, he's proving that these Judaizers are not as good as exegetes as they might seem. The next point in your notes is that all who rely on works are under a curse. All who rely on works are under a curse. Now, what is this curse business about? It's not some weird Harry Potter type spell curse. If we go all the way back to Genesis 3, we see that the curse is death. As soon as sin came into God's perfect world, the curse of death spread to everything. A lot of it, we see this. We see this everywhere. We see this even in the way trees die, and we just see death everywhere because the curse of death is all over the world. Then Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 27 to show that the route of works leads to this curse when he says, Deuteronomy 27 26, he says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. The next quote, he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4, a minor prophet from the Old Testament, when he says, The righteous shall live by faith. He's showing that the Old Testament scriptures affirm that the righteous ones are not of, of the law, but are of faith. Lastly, he quotes again from the law in Leviticus 18.5, when he says, the one who does them shall live by them. What he means by that, the one who does them shall live by them, is that if you want to go this route, then you go by these rules. He's pointing out that if you choose to go the route of submitting to the law, then you must obey what the law says. And what does the law say? Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. And as James 2.10 teaches, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. That is why everyone under the law is under a curse. He's saying, you know no one is perfect, and you also know perfection is the standard. So you know that no one can be saved through the law. You know that this route leads to death. Further, he's showing them that this hybrid route does not exist. Because if you are not walking by faith alone, you are walking the route of works, which leads to death. There was a study done by Arizona Christian University in 2020. It was a wide-scale survey. And in the survey, they found that 48% of U.S. adults agree with this statement. That a person who is generally good or does good enough things for others will earn a place in heaven. 48% of people agreed with that statement. And you might think these are just all these people from these different religions. No, because out of the professing Christians that were surveyed, 52% of professing Christians agreed with that statement that a person who is generally good or does good enough things for others will earn a place in heaven. Over half of professing Christians do not agree with the foundational truth that Jesus is enough. Over half of professing Christians are choosing to take the route of their works rather than the route of faith in Jesus Christ. We are right now living in a culture that has fallen under a false teaching very similar to that of the Judaizers. Not that people are going around saying that we need to be circumcised and submit to the Old Testament law, but they're this teaching is going rampant, this idea that we can somehow earn our place before God, or the general principle that as Christians, our standing before God is based on what we do. This is everywhere. This is not just in Galatia. This is in our culture. And let me just say again how crucial it is to understand the doctrine that Jesus is enough. And brothers and sisters, in your evangelism, as you go out into this culture, be aware that a majority of people that you interact with, view Christianity with a very faulty lens. Even people you interact with in your life that call themselves Christian, several of them have a very, very distorted view of what that means and think that somehow they can earn their way, they can be good enough to earn God's favor. It's important that we're aware of this. It's important that we look for opportunities to correct this misunderstanding because it is fatal to believe that Jesus is not enough. Now let me stop for a second and say that if you're here today and maybe this is all new to you, maybe Christianity, religion, all of that is new to you and you haven't really looked that much into it, but for some reason you're here today, first I just want to welcome you and say I'm so, so happy you're here. 
Second, I just want to say that if you have been handed this idea of Christianity, this version of Christianity that teaches that generally good people will go to heaven and generally bad people will go to hell, then I am so sorry. Because that is not at all what this book teaches. The word of God is very clear. Paul is very clear here that those who depend on their works to be saved are cursed because we are all lawbreakers. You will never be generally good enough to get to heaven because the standard is absolute perfection. You are not enough and you never will be. The study also found that 54% of Americans believe they will be in heaven after they pass away. Now, if you're in that 54% that believes they're going to heaven, and also part of that 48% that believes you'll get there by leading a good life, then you must know today that on the authority of God's word, you stand condemned. If you want to bet on yourself, you're free to do so. But it's a bad bet. But praise be to God, because there is a greater hope. Continue with me. Verse 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. All of us are cursed. Because of our sin, humanity has the curse of death. Now, throughout history, we've advanced in several ways, especially in the last 20 years, as we've seen advancement. We've seen us being able to fix all these problems and come up with all these medicines and all these things. But the one thing that we've never been able to fix and never will be able to fix is death. Death continues to spread everywhere, and we can't do anything about it. Death is the one guarantee for every person. It is destined for all of us to die. When I talk about death, I'm not just talking about passing away from this world. I'm talking about an eternal death where we are to receive the just wrath of God because of our sin. This is our curse. In contrary to what almost every other religion teaches, you cannot uncurse yourself by doing a couple good deeds. We need someone else to redeem us from the curse, and that is what Jesus did. Verse 13, he redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The curse of death that has plagued all of humanity, the Son of God came to earth and bore. The Son of God fully became our sin. And he did not have to do that. He would have been perfectly fine to leave our cursed, sinful selves to to face the judgment for our actions. But in his unfathomable love, he stepped in and he reached out. The Lord came to earth. He lived perfectly. He was good enough to receive eternal blessing. But he took on our curse instead. And because he was enough, because he was worthy, because he proved himself to be God by rising from the dead, In victory, his sacrifice was enough to remove the curse from us completely if only we put our faith in him. Jesus is enough. So what do we do with all of this? Well, first I'd like to say that if you've realized that you have not been living like this statement is true, if you've not been really truly believing that Jesus is enough, then perhaps this is the day that can change for you. If you've been living with this mindset of trying to earn God's favor, of striving to live a generally good life so you can be good enough and be in good standing with God, it's time to give that up. It's time to run to Jesus. It's time to accept that you cannot do it and put your faith in the one who can. It's time to accept that you are not enough, but Jesus is. And that'll be the last point in your notes. I am not enough, but Jesus is. Verse 14 says, So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Christ took on our curse so that we can receive his blessing. Martin Luther calls this the great exchange. He took on our curse so that we could have his blessing. Rest in that truth. And I know this can seem too good to be true. Trust me, I know. 
Maybe your whole life you felt the need to prove yourself to everyone. Prove yourself to your parents, prove yourself to teachers, prove yourself to coaches, prove yourself to your bosses, prove yourself to your family. Maybe your worth has always been determined by how you perform and it's hard to think of it any differently. But in Jesus, you have nothing to prove. It's not about you or what you have done. It's about him and what he has done for you. We all have to make the decision, the decision to rely on ourselves or rely on Jesus because all of us one day will be before the throne. And you will either have to answer for your works. If you choose to go the route of works, you will have to answer for your works. You will have to face the judgment for your works. Or if you choose to go the route of faith, then you will be covered by the Lamb of God. And you will, God will judge you by his works and not you. And you will receive his blessing and not the curse that you deserve. We all have to choose. So what will you choose? And for those here who do have faith in Jesus already, those of you who have received this blessing already through faith, Perhaps there are times where you still feel like there's more for you to do. You feel this burden that you need to prove yourself to God. You're thinking like some of these Galatians who received the Spirit through faith, but were now convinced that they still needed to submit to the law in order to be right before God. And I understand this. I understand this burden that we feel like we need to prove ourselves to God, that we need to prove our loyalty to Him. Martin Luther once also said, he said that he preached justification by faith alone every week to his church because every week they forgot it. And that's so true. How often do we forget this foundational truth that Jesus is enough and that our standing before God is no longer dependent on what our works. Brothers and sisters, if you get nothing out of this sermon, let it at least be a reminder to you this morning that the punishment deserved by your sin has been fully satisfied in Jesus Christ. In John 19.30, after Jesus had just been betrayed by those closest to him, arrested, beaten, mocked, spat on, after they dug a crown of thorns into his head, after they ruthlessly whipped his back, after they made him carry his own cross and put nails in his hands and his feet, as he dragged his bloody back up and down the wooden cross, after he had taken on the full wrath of God Almighty with the entirety of the weight, guilt, and shame of your sin on his soul, after satisfying his thirst with sour wine, the Son of God looked up to heaven and he said, it is finished. It is finished. Can we all just take a deep breath in that? It is finished. The sacrifice is paid. The work is done. Jesus did not say, it is almost finished. I did my part. Hopefully they do theirs. No, and we laugh because we know that's not true. We know that what Jesus did was enough, but we still often live with this mindset that he didn't. We live with this mindset that there's still more for us to do to be right before him. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing left to do to be right before God. There is nothing left to do but to have full faith in him and accept the grace that he has freely poured out upon you. It does seem too good to be true, but it is true. It is finished. We are forever redeemed and the curse has been broken. We are set free. So live in that freedom. As Paul pleads with the church later in this letter, he says, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Some of you are submitting yourselves again to a yoke of slavery, slavery by acting like there is more for you to do. But we are free. As we sang about this morning, live in that freedom. Dance in that freedom. It is true. Be released. Please be released from the burden of proving yourself to God. Because if you are in Christ, when God looks down on you, he sees perfection. He sees holiness. He sees blamelessness. Even at your very weakest point, if you are in Jesus, he sees perfection. Why? Because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Live in the freedom that Christ has bought for you. Live in the freedom that Christ suffered for you to have. 
And yes, strive to live righteously. Strive to live a righteous life. But not out of fear of judgment if you don't. Strive to live righteously out of a love and a reverence for God and love for his people. Do not live righteously to achieve your salvation, but flowing out of the salvation that Jesus has given you. Not because Jesus is not enough, but because Jesus is enough, and he always will be. Would you pray with me? Lord, I don't have the words to thank you for what you did for us. We were cursed, we were condemned in our sin. We were not enough, we were not even close. But Lord, you stepped in, you reached out. You saved us, Lord. You released us from the curse of death and sin. You fully became our curse, you fully became our sin so that we can be set free. Lord, there is nothing more amazing than that statement. And there is nothing that can take that truth away. Lord, the devil has lost. You saved us from him. And now the devil's only strategy he has left is to try to make us forget that truth. He has no more cards left to play. So Lord, I pray against that for this church. I pray that we would not forget, Lord, that you were enough, that we are seen as blameless in your eyes because of what you did for us. Let us not fall under the misunderstanding, Lord, that we are judged based on our works as children of God. And Lord, for those in here who maybe have never put their faith in Christ, Lord, they stand right now condemned, Lord, because their faith is in their own works. Lord, I pray right now for anyone in this room, Lord, that Today would be the day that they put their faith in Christ, that they can be covered by the Lamb of God, covered by your blood, because we are not enough. We all know that, Lord. We all confess we are not enough, but you are. We had a debt that you paid. Lord, you set us free. Thank you for that truth. Help us live in that truth. And Lord, now we... I want to just spend some time worshiping you, worshiping you for what you did for us and the freedom that you bought for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.